Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam Ward, Director of Studies of the Institute, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to Bloomsbury House for this discussion on oil as an instrument of Russia's foreign and security uh, policy. And I suppose, as the invitation to this event indicated, uh, Russia's natural resources, and especially its energy wealth, uh, has really powered Russia's recovery, both in terms of economic stability and in terms of a general self-confidence since the 1998 default, and I suppose even further back than that, since the collapse and fragmentation of the Soviet Union centered on Russia. Um, that energy wealth also um, accords Russia an obvious and a structural importance in the world economy. But all of the indications are that uh, Moscow is not content simply to sit on this reservoir of strategic importance, but to do everything that it can uh, to instrumentalize it, to put it in the service of foreign and security policy priorities and objectives that it defines for itself. And while this has been perhaps most vividly uh, on display in terms of gas, uh, it's oil that we think also deserves uh, a good deal uh, of attention. And that is, in fact, um, the focus of the talk today. Um, the talk will focus on the ways, the means, uh, the objectives, and the implications of oil in respect of Russian foreign security policy. And our speaker today uh, is my colleague, Dr. Nicholas Redman, who is Senior Fellow for Geopolitical Risk and Economic Security uh, at the Institute. Um, he contains multitudes in the sense that he's also the editor of the Adelphi book series, which ranges over a very wide area of uh, subject matter and is the principal expressions of the expression of the research agenda of the Institute in publication terms. Mm -hmm. And he's also managing director of our corporate um, advisory arm, um, Arundel Strategic uh, Consulting. And in fact, his background is a very much a consulting background, having worked at Oxford Analytica and the Economist Intelligence Unit before uh, joining us. So I'm going to hand over to him. He's going to speak um, on the record. Uh, we have a camera, so I guess it is on the record, uh, by hint. Uh, uh, for about 30 minutes or so, 20 or 30 minutes or so, and then um, he'll take um, questions on any areas that he hasn't covered uh, sufficiently, as you might like him to, or he might like himself to. So, Nick, over to you. Uh, thank you, Adam. Um, hearing my list of duties, it's perhaps not, I no longer surprise myself that it's taken about three years for me to actually get up on the stage in front of an ISS audience to give a presentation. I've been terribly busy. Um, when somewhat breathless commentaries talk about Russia using energy as a weapon against neighboring states, they nearly always mean gas rather than oil. That is what the showdowns with Ukraine and Belarus were principally about in the last decade. Nevertheless, the supply of oil from Russia has been used in the pursuit of a number of objectives that go beyond the merely commercial. These include the control of infrastructure in neighboring states, the exercise of influence over other CIS oil producers by encouraging their dependence on Russian routes, keeping markets in the states of the former Soviet bloc dependent on Russian energy supplies for political and commercial reasons, varying export duties and delivery schedules to reward or punish CIS partners, and playing off potential ta transit and customer states against each other. However, I think it's important to place these incidents, in, these incidents into their proper context, which is that oil is a big business in Russia, while the commodity is fungible and the price is not easily influenced. On the production side, we have a competitive sector comprised mostly of profit-maximizing companies, several of which are privately owned. On the regulatory side, the Russian government seeks to ensure that the domestic market is well supplied, supplied and that thereafter exports are maximized in order to swell tax receipts. It should be noticed that as the years have gone on, Russia has become more and more reliant on, so on oil as a source of revenue, with the receipts having risen uh, at the same time as spending obligations have too. On the transit side, the state-owned pipeline monopoly Transneft, while working to the government's mandate, also has its own interests. These are to main its, maintain its control over the sector and to increase its network, revenue and resources. If the oil companies can be seen as mini empires aspiring to build themselves up, I would argue that Transneft should be viewed in a similar way. Also part of the equ equation are peripheral players, including Russian railways and some of the major oil traders. I think to that you could probably also add some of the pipeline manufacturers and other transit companies. Now, these actors each have distinct objectives and instruments at their control, though over time their objectives and their relative power have changed. 
So while this talk uh, includes the word policy in the title, it would perhaps be more accurate to speak of policies. And just as there is much politicking within Russia, there, sorry, and there is just as much politicking within Russia as outside it. That, however, is another topic. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the changes that have occurred in Russian oil exports and particularly the export infrastructure over the last 15 years because they are enormous and profound. As Anthony Robinson of the FT once quipped, the Soviet Union produced 10 million barrels a day and still went bankrupt. In fact, at its peak in 1987, Russia produced 11 million of the Soviet Union's 12 million barrels a day. However, the collapse of the Soviet Union was followed by a collapse in the Russian oil industry. Between 1990 and 1998, it was in a situation of free fall. Um, production fell from 10 million barrels a day to just over 6 million. Consumption fell from 5 million barrels to 3.25 million. Exports to the Soviet states shrank nearly to nothing from about 2.4 million barrels a day to just under half a million barrels a day. The only indicator that didn't go into tailspin was exports beyond the former Soviet Union. So although these dropped sharply in the early 1990s, they actually increased between 1990 and 1998 from 2 million barrels a day to about 2.2 million. Now, as we now know, 1998 was the bottom for Russian oil production. Thereafter, output started a sustained and even vertiginous rise, while consumption basically flatlined, meaning that rising volumes were available for export and pushing to find any route out imaginable. This was a problem that the oil companies faced very quickly was one of infrastructure. The Soviet pipeline system was built to accommodate huge internal demand and to supply abundant <coughs> quantities of crude oil to its Warsaw Pact allies. What it lacked was terminals that could accommodate super tankers and had easy access to the world's oceans. And for Russia, this situation was compounded when the Soviet Union collapsed by the loss of control over ports in Ukraine and the Baltic states. In the 15 years since 1998, we have seen a huge construction program to facilitate exports beyond the CIS. New pipelines and gigantic terminals on Russia's Baltic coast, the expansion of capacity at the Black Sea ports, a pipeline from Central Asia to the Black Sea, new terminals in the Arctic and the Russian Far East, and most recently a pipeline that we're now calling ESPO, stretching from eastern Siberia to China and also onto Russia's Pacific coast. A comparison between 1998 and 2012, which is the last year for which I can drag data, underlies the extent of these changes. In 1998, Russia was exporting just over 1 million barrels a day down the Druzhba pipeline that goes into Germany and the Visegrad states. It exported a little less than a million barrels a day from Ukrainian and Russian ports on the Black Sea, and then exported a further approximately 350,000 barrels a day from ports in the Baltic states. So the total was approximately 2.3 million barrels a day. Flip forward to 2012, and the exports are nearer 4 million barrels a day. In fact, they're slightly above that. Two things in 2012 have a little change. Still, Russia is exporting about a million barrels a day down Druzhba, and it's still exporting just under a million barrels a day through the Black Sea, although Ukrainian ports have now largely been cut out of that particular equation. The gigantic changes have, have occurred in the northwest and in the east. Uh, in the Baltic, the non-Russian ports have been shut down entirely. Um, while the gigantic terminal at Primorsk opened in 2001, handled 1.4 million barrels per day in 2012. In addition, the ESPO pipeline, which I mentioned earlier, going to the east, has delivered this past year over 600,000 barrels a day to China and to the port of Cosmino on the Pacific. When you add in exports from small ports in the Arctic and Far East, then we get to a figure of over 4 million barrels a day, and that doesn't include exports to the former Soviet states. The dramatic increase in pipeline capacity that we've seen, the opening up of new export channels in Asia and northwestern Europe, was not without its problems. In the early 2000s, Transneft, as the state monopoly, failed to keep pace with the oil companies. It could not build its capacity quickly enough to match the output growth that the oil companies were posting, which was double digit for a lot of that time. In 2002, 2003, 2004 also, Russia's railway system and its rivers were filled with tankers and barges carrying crude oil for export. There were times also before the Yukos affair when Transneft's monopoly over the export infrastructure was under threat. And I would argue that the construction of ESPO only happened when it did because of the financial crisis in Western markets. Nevertheless, by 2012, Russia found itself in the position where it was no longer capacity constrained, thanks to those new pipelines and also the slowdown in oil output growth. And yet, despite this comfortable situation and the huge cost of new projects, Transneft seems minded to add another 1 million barrels a day of capacity from ESPO and another 600,000 barrels a day from Usluga. In fact, that port is already up and running. 
So for the first time in its history, Russia has switched capacity, and that's a point I'd like to come to right at the end. So where does politics and foreign policy fit into this picture? I'd like to suggest um, five themes uh, that seem to be arise particularly when looking at the interaction between business and foreign policy for Russia in this regard. Firstly, there is a drive to control the infrastructure of exports. As oil output stabilized and began to rise after 1998, Transneft sought to increase its capacity at, at existing ports in Novorossiysk through a process of debottlenecking de the pipeline system, by expanding the pipelines to Fedit, and by building new pipelines and terminals on Russian territory. The greatest of these was at the Russian uh, port of Primorsk on the Gulf of Finland, which was then connected to the main oil producing regions by a new pipeline, the Baltic Pipeline System. And as we have a second one, I'm now going to refer to that as BPS-1. Um, the rationale for building this additional capacity at Primorsk in the late 90s and early 2000s was threefold. With output rising, Russia quite simply needed the extra capacity. By locating the terminal pipeline solely on Russian territory, it was more secure. And crucially, by keeping everything on home soil, it was, it was not necessary to share transit fees. Now, this is where we come to the distinction between different actors within, uh, within the Russian scene. Um, this was not necessarily in, in the interest of the oil companies, but it was certainly in the interest of Transneft, which had a distinctly mercantilist mentality and had no wish to share any of the wealth of Russia's oil industry with neighboring states. Alongside this push to build new capacity in the Baltic region, however, Transneft also sought to gain control over the oil infrastructure in the Baltic states, which had been an integral part of the Soviet oil industry and had been built to a Russian design with Russian capital and Russian labor. The fact that the Baltic states had become dependent did not necessarily mean, in the eyes of Russia's oil industry, that these were wholly foreign uh, items of infrastructure. In 1999, when the US firm Williams International was selected to own and manage Lithuania's Mzeki oil refinery and Butinga oil, oil export terminal, that was the only oil refinery in the Baltic states, that remains the case today, Transneft and one Russian oil company, I'm going to name coil, restricted supplies to Lithuania. This was not a complete cutoff, but the deliveries were neither large enough nor regular enough to ensure that the refinery could operate profitably. Now, this semi-stranglehold stayed in place for two years until 2001, when another Russian oil company, Yukos, came forward with a pledge to increase supplies and, as part of that deal, took a 27% stake in, in the project. I think it's important to note, because often in the write-ups of this incident now, they say Williams was hounded out by Transneft. That's not actually true. The refinery was operating fine in 2001, 2002, and it was Williams' problems back in its home market in the United States that forced it to sell up, at which point UCOS became a majority shareholder. Perhaps buoyed by the triumph of Russian capital in Lithuania, and in the knowledge that its terminal at Primorsk was now up and running, Transneft in mid-2002 began to cut back volumes of crude delivered to vent spills, the Latvian port that throughout the previous decade had been the largest export outlet for Russian crude on the Baltic Sea. By October, deliveries had fallen to a trickle, and the head of Transneft demanded that Russia should receive an equity stake or else the deliveries would never resume. There was no talk of money changing hands. It was simply hand over the equity, or else you get nothing. At the end of 2002, indeed, the pipeline was shut. And in spring 2003, the final ultimatum was given to the Latvian government. Unless Transneft received a 50% stake in vents bills, the pipeline would never reopen. The Latvian government at that time held only a 38% stake, and it was unable to broker a deal among existing shareholders. And the pipeline has been, remained shut ever since. In 2006, the focus shifted back to Lithuania. By that time, UCOS had, broke, had been broken up within Russia, but its Lithuanian asset had remained beyond the hands of the Russian bailiffs. However, without any oil to actually produce to fill the supply to the pipeline, uh, the UCOS heirs were keen to sell. Again, Russian companies came forward. So too did a Kazakh firm, but after Russian pressure, the Kazakh firm was persuaded to step back. The Lithuanian government, failing to take the hint, nevertheless selected a Polish firm, PK Norlin, as the buyer of the, of the facility. The contract was signed in May 2006, and in July, several months before the deal was even closed, Transneft cut supplies entirely. It claimed that the pipeline had ruptured and needed repair. This was evidently an effort to torpedo the sale and install a Russian owner at the refinery and terminal. When the Poles completed the deal anyway, Transneft announced it would not, under any circumstances, repair the pipeline. 
And since then, the terminal in Butingi, which up to that point had been used for Russian exports, is now importing Russian crude, ironically, from Primorsk in order to feed that refinery. What's so striking about these episodes, but particularly vent spills, is that Transneft visited damage on the Russian budget, and therefore the core interests of its controlling shareholder, in order to promote its own agenda. In late 2002, the heads of five of the six largest Russian oil companies wrote to the Russian Prime Minister to complain about Transneft's blockade, and to in insist that if it was not reversed, they might actually start capping oil wells. Uh, they subsequently lobbied to try and get, trans uh, to try and get vent spills back on the export schedule for the second quarter, first quarter, and then the second quarter. Those efforts failed. Uh, Transneft was not for turning. Some argue that Primorsk's opening in 2001 um, and ramp up dramatically thereafter enabled Transneft to pressure Latvia without seriously affecting Russian e oil exports. The data, unfortunately for those people, tell a very different story. Without vent spills capacity of over 300,000 barrels a day, at a time when Russian oil companies were posting double-digit output growth, Transneft's network could not cope with the volume of crude that, wanted to be, that needed to be exported. The volume of crude exports that had to go via railway and barges, which was much more expensive, at that time spiked from 2001, when it was uh, exporting approximately 300,000 barrels a day via uh, rail and barge, um, it, it spiked to 700,000 barrels a day in 2004-2005. And that level didn't actually come down to the previous mark till about 2007. So if disrupting ex exports was the overriding goal, Transneft made its move against vent spills at least two years early. The logic of such hardball tactics was clear enough. In a situation of fast rising crude output and with oil companies pressing for additional export capacity, it was preferable to use Primorsk and the Baltic pipeline system to increase the system's capacity rather than to use these new Russian facilities to bypass the Baltic. But with one very important caveat, that those Baltic short ports had to be under Russian control. In order to achieve this, Transneft had no qualms about reducing the earnings of Russian oil companies and thus of the Russian Treasury. And once it had been refused by the Lithuanians and by the Latvians, the pipeline monopoly went out of its way to put the Baltic ports out of business, despite, uh, and it was deaf to the pleas of Russia's oil industry in doing so. The second theme, and these get shorter, uh, maintaining Kazakh and Azerbaijani dependence on Russia for oil exports. One of the main sources of tension between the oil companies and the authorities in the early 2000s when the system was under such strain was that the government had insisted on reserving space, significant space, in the pipeline network for Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. This cost the Russian oil companies billions of dollars in export revenue over a several year period, and indeed it cost the government too. By 2000, some 250,000 barrels a day of Kazakh and Azeri crude were moving through Russia's pipeline network and were being exported via the Black Sea. Volumes had nearly doubled to half a million barrels a day by 2005, and they've continued at slightly below that level for the rest of the decade. In addition, in 2001, the Caspian Pipeline Consortium opened a line between Tengiz Field in Kazakhstan and Novorossiysk on the Russian Black Sea. It was the only sizable oil pipeline in Russia ever not to be owned by Transneft, although the Russian government was the largest single shareholder in it. By the mid-2000s, this line was carrying 700,000 barrels a day. For Russia's government, these arrangements with Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan had several advantages. First, it created a common interest between Russia and Kazakhstan and established a hefty Kazakh dependence on Russian export infrastructure. It was not until 2006 that Kazakhstan opened an export pipeline to China, which broke Russia's near monopoly up to that point. Even today, Russian pipelines carry five times more Kazakh crude for export than does the pipeline to China. The ploy was less successful with Azerbaijan, which exported smaller volumes than Kazakhstan did via the Russian system, and in 2006 opened its baku tbilisi Johan pipeline to Turkey's Mediterranean coast. Today, over 90% of, of Azerbaijani crude exports are delivered via the BTC line and via Georgian ports, over which Russia has no control. Nevertheless, the transit deals did enable Russia to exert a measure of control over these CIS producers. Transneft has always denied them access to Druzhba and for years kept Caspian exporters exclusively tied to the Black Sea, rather than allowing them access to the North European market through Primorsk. Uh, I would add also that the oil alliance with Kazakhstan is obviously an important element of the economic and political relationship on which is now being built the Eurasian Union. A third theme, protecting Russia's traditional markets for commercial and political reasons. The flip side of exerting control over Caspian exports is that it limited the scope for countries like Ukraine or Belarus to source its crude from suppliers other than Russia. 
In the early 2000s, Ukraine completed a pipeline, the Odessa Brody pipeline in the west of the country that was intended to bring Caspian crew into, into the country and possibly onto Belarus and East Central Europe, all of which are Russia's traditional oil markets. In the event, and despite interest from Kazakhstan in supplying volumes of crude, perhaps under Russian pressure, the Ukrainian authorities accepted a Russian offer to run the Odessa Brody line in the reverse direction. In effect, it became part of Russia's oil export infrastructure rather than a competitor to it. This started at a time when Russia was desperately short of, of crude capacity, so there was a large commercial element to the decision. However, it is impossible to deny the political implications of maintaining Ukraine's total reliance on Russia as a supplier of oil and gas to the country. And it's only in the last three years that Ukraine has begun to diversify its sources of crude by buying oil from Azerbaijan. Fourth. Variations in export duties and delivery schedules have been used to reward allies and pressure reluctant partners. This applies principally to Belarus, which 10 years ago hit upon a lucrative scheme. It imported cr Russian crude oil duty free, refined it, and then sold the products to the EU for a huge markup. This was the principal source of hard currency for an economy and a government that re retained many state controls and traded principally with Russia. In 2007, perhaps frustrated at Belarus's refusal to either share the proceeds or show more consideration for Russian interests, the Russian government imposed tariffs on supplies of crude to Belarus. Minsk responded by hiking transit fees on Russian oil delivered to European states down Druzhba, and when Russia refused to pay these higher fees, Belarus closed the pipeline. This dispute, by the way, was the genesis of the second Baltic pipeline, or BPS-2, that terminates at Usluga, another Russian port on the Gulf of Finland. The matter was eventually settled by a new deal through which Belarus agreed to share proceeds of its oil exports to the EU with Russia. When that didn't work, Russia sw switched to providing Belarus simply with enough crude duty-free for its domestic needs while applying duty on supplies earmarked for export. Revenue sharing has remained a controversial subject, however. Um, last year, Belarus exported rather low levels of oil products. Um, it sent back to Russia a tiny proportion of the oil products that it was meant under agreements to sell there. It did, however, become one of the world's leading exporters of solvents and diluents. Now, within Russia, the suspicion was that what the Belarusians had done was either ship out gasoline and diesel and simply mislabeled it in order to avoid having to share the proceeds, or else had made a tiny chemical change to those things that could be easily reversed in order to frustrate uh, the revenue sharing that way. Following protests from Moscow, uh, Belarus has now uh, got out of the uh, solvent and diluent export business on the grand scale that it was on. Uh, an a quarterly schedule has been imposed on Belarus, and uh, uh, things appear to be back on an even keel. Still, oil supply is very obviously one of the central elements in Russia's relationship with Belarus and in its efforts to deepen economic, military, and political integration on Russian terms. Fifthly and finally, oil supply and proposed pipelines are a way of playing off prospective customers or transit states. One of the clearest examples of this is the way Russian authorities sought to create competition between China and Japan over whether that pipeline to the east would initially run into China or to Russia's Pacific coast where Japan could buy the cargoes. At one point it almost appeared as if Russia was actually conducting an auction to see who could offer the best financing package. In actual fact, of course, this was not a proper auction because using Japan, Japan was simply being used instrumentally in order to drive a better price out of China. And this again speaks to an over overarching political motive, because under Putin, Kremlin has been determined to forge a strategic relationship with China in which energy will be Russia's principal contribution, or certainly one of them. And the, one of the only ways also that Russia can begin to equalize the enormous trade deficit with China. I don't think I've ever heard talk of a Russo-Japanese strategic partnership. Another example of creating competition between potential transit states concerned the bypass options through the Bosphorus, the crowded Turkish Strait, either across Bulgaria to Greece or down through Turkey from the Black Sea coast to the Mediterranean. By est establishing these two alternatives and putting them in competition to each other, Russia sought to increase its bargaining leverage vis-à-vis -vis Ankara and Sofia. And in both cases, the oil pipeline was part of a broader energy negotiation. With Bulgaria, it was the Burgas Alexandropolis pipeline, the South Stream gas pipeline, and the Belena nuclear plant. In the case of Turkey, it was again South Stream, although this was the uh, undersea part, um, and also the question of whether Turkey would host a, uh, an Azerbaijani oil pipeline across Anatolia and through to Europe. <coughs> 
The recent commissioning, let me end on a speculative note. The recent commissioning of BPS2 and Ustluga, plus the prospect of further expansions of the Espo line, raises the possibility of Russia playing off its suitors on a much grander scale because of the first time it has excess capacity and the opportunity to switch sizable volumes between the Baltic and the Black Sea and Asia. With Rosneft just having pledged additional volumes to China in the last two weeks and planning also a huge petrochemicals complex in the Russian Far East, which its Siberian fields may not be able to sustain, there is a genuine prospect, it seems to me, of more crude switching from west to east, leaving Europe short, particularly down the Druzhba pipeline. That could strengthen Russia's hands in any number of package deals of the kind I mentioned, such as with Bulgaria. But equally, it could create an opportunity for Caspian producers to establish a foothold in the European market via Ukraine or another Black Sea state. That too would have geopolitical implications, especially in the context of Russia seeking to foster Eurasian integration over the reservations of several of its putative partners. So, to conclude. There are several different actors or agents in the oil sector that have the ability and inclination to involve themselves in the affairs of other states and engage in what we might broadly term foreign policy behavior. These actors or agents differ significantly with regard to their objectives that they pursue, and they do not always coordinate. Perhaps for that reason, the track record of success, I would argue, is distinctly mixed. Objectives tend to be a mix of, per of commercial and political interests rather than purely political. The export of the Russian model of business, for instance, looms larger than wholly unrelated concerns. And finally, in terms of instruments, I think we should note there are plenty of carrots as well as sticks. Thank you. Great, Nick, thank you very much for uh, uh, capturing through a lot of detail in a presentation that was uh, wide and deep. It has left us with a good chunk of time now to take some questions and follow up on some of the, the assertions that you've made and the observations that uh, you shared. If you would like to ask a question, just uh, make a comment, just raise your hand, and then for the benefit of everybody here, identify uh, yourself. I may have to uh, repeat your question, not because it's unintelligible, but because um, the audio system requires that I do that for the benefit of the, the camera, because it won't capture what you say. Uh, gentleman here in the third row. Yes, just go straight in. Just no microphones, just uh, use your diaphragm. What are the effects of prospective U.S. energy independence arising from shale gas on prices and foreign policy? Um, okay. um, Let me stick to oil rather than gas. Um, very tempted to stay first. I'm not a fortune teller, but here goes. Um, I don't see a huge problem for Russia immediately in terms of US self-sufficiency because Russia wasn't actually producing much to that market. I think the shale revolution potentially could be a savior for Russian output over the next 10 years because if you look at the depletion of Western Siberia over the past four or five years and you look at the realistic estimates for how long it's going to take some of those Arctic pro projects to come on stream and you see that Russia is facing potentially a gap a shortfall, an inability to maintain its production and, and exports at the current level. Now, a lot of the shale res uh, reserves are located in western Siberia, where the infrastructure is already in place, where the pipelines are already in place. In fact, some of the business deposits are directly below existing oil fields. So if they can be tapped effectively, then that is the best way, I suspect, that Russia will get through to 2020, 2025, 2030, with 10 million barrels a day of production. Nevertheless, the question is how far, for me, the question is how far the shale revolution is going to go. And if it takes off in other parts of the world, then we can have a situation where several years from now, there is so much oil on the market that oil is no longer a hundred dollar a barrel commodity, but is perhaps a 60 or 70 bar barrel a do do uh, dollar a barrel commodity. And in that case, um, the entire budgetary system of Russia is in a very sticky position, particularly if oil doesn't bounce back. That, by the way, is why um, there's a debate in Russia currently about whether they should be tapping 
um, the reserve fund to build infrastructure. The orthodox crowd say, no, you must keep it in case oil prices dip because we need to be able to smooth out that. The, uh, the radicals say, that's all very well if the oil price does bounce back, but if it doesn't bounce back, two years down the line, we're going to have mo no money and no roads. Des Byrne. Doesn't I have a member of the Institute? Uh, can you just say something about the structure of these national companies? We talked about private and national, but clearly it's national, nationalized you know, companies that call the shots. I mean, are these just outshoots of the Kremlin, or do they have sort of some sense of their own interest and their own um, identity, and therefore you know, uh, the possibility that they might come to strife with you know, the government? So the question was about um, the structure of the uh, national companies, and I suppose the extent to which they are independent or instrumental. Okay. Um, well, to disagree with you at the start, when we were looking at, at sort of 2000, uh, there were mainly private companies and state share in, in Russian oil output, oil output was some in a region of only 30%. Um, although via Transneft, of course, the government did exert control over the entire sector. Um, on the national oil companies, are they just Kremlin offshoots? Well, um, in a sense, yes, but um, they're certainly not in coordination. I, I think the easiest way to describe it is as these, these sort of empires in the making that have their own interests. It, there is no love lost between Rosneft and Gazprom, or Gazprom Neft. Um, um, uh, each is trying to invade the other's turf with as, uh, as much abandon as, as, as humanly possible. Um, so I, I think the, how can I put it, the fusion, the genius of Putinism, I would argue, is the fusion of the interests of some of these leaders with the interests of the state. So um, building up Gazprom uh, in the oil sector um, um, and, and encouraging some of the other companies, then encouraging Rosneft to go into the gas sector is actually a good way of putting a little stick onto everyone and therefore um, uh, creating an incentive to increase uh, efficiency in the sector. Because the problem is with you know, sort of post-2005, 2006, output growth slowed dramatically. That did coincide, obviously, with the state uh, exerting more of a grip over the entire sector. Thank you. A uh, gentleman in the row at the back. Thank you. Uh, John Muff, uh, Ch Chatham House. If I may, just uh, a brief comment and then a uh, question. You don't necessarily have to summarize the comment. I'll just have a bit of a comment related to um, <coughs> Lithuania back in 2006. Uh, I was asked to go quite heavily involved with um, some of the in the negotiations at the time between TNKPP and the Lithuanian government, uh, which was an interesting experience in several ways. Um, but what, what to me was absolutely fascinating was it, it was clear that if the Polish company came in, there would be a supply issue. The Lithuanian government did want to guarantee supply to the refinery. And of course, there was always the, the sea route, but that was going to affect the economics. And as far as I'm aware, the air always assumed it would be pipeline uh, So it was certainly no surprise to anybody at TNKPP that within two weeks of the deal being signed, there were 6,500 defects in the spur of the Druzhka to, to that pipeline. So extremely puzzling to my mind how PPM got that deal done, particularly since they have been paid enormously for the, uh, the asset and what they particularly, particularly possible questions to be asked. The, the, um, the, the question I wanted to put over was uh, about um, Transnet's political relationships and how they stand at present and whether you, you know anything in particular about the relationship between Bosnia and Okay, uh, to save Adam, I will repeat the question, um, which is, um, um, what about the relationship between um, um, some of the bigger oil companies right now and, and Transneft, um, which is a great question. Um, if we look back to the early 2000s, I think it's very clear that Transneft had the whip hand, and that's partly why I spent so much time talking about some of the Lithuanian and Latvian incidents. Um, if we look what has happened over the past year or so, particularly with, uh, with the construction of ESPO, it appears that um, Rosneft probably has more sway now than Transneft when it comes to issues that cannot be resolved between them and so have to be booted up to the highest level in order for a decision to be taken. Um, 
every Russian oil company paid for the construction of ESPO through higher transit fees. But it is Rosneft that is really the, by far and away, the principal beneficiary. I think Luke Oil has had maybe one cargo in the second quarter export schedule for Cosmino only. Um, it's mainly a, 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 a Rosneft um, uh, vehicle, and yet everybody pays for it. Um, we've seen a, a, over the last week or so, we've seen a big dust up between, uh, between the head of Transneft and between Sechin, specifically over the issue of who is going to pay for the upgrade of ESPO 2. And the latest uh, comments from Sechin, I read them as, as saying that actually everyone is going to be paying for this infrastructure rather than Rosneft specifically. Um, although you know, perhaps some sort of compromise will be reached whereby Rosneft pays a bit more than everybody else. I don't know. But I think that's one of the big changes. If, if we look at the increase in state uh, influence within the sector, it's actually been that now the pecking order between the various agents has changed somewhat and Transneft has been a loser in that. I think it's also assailed, part of the reason they were interested in ESPO, um, they were losing out to the rail suppliers in terms of the new Asian market. Um, and so building that pipeline was actually terribly important in order to get themselves back at the center of the game. Thank you. Yes, Ahmed. question was um, about some of the changes in the various standing of um, oil traders and in particular Gennady Timchenko's uh, Gunvor, which appears to have lost quite a lot of uh, sway um, within the oil trading sector. Oil traders was one of the things I mentioned at the top because I think it is a part of the picture, although not one I particularly understand very well. Um, I think it was, I think the moves that Timchenko and Gunvor have made um, into gas in the past two years, um, and particularly taking over Novatech, which is to develop the Yamal LNG um, project, which we're now pretty certain is actually going to be the only gas project thus far to be exempted from Gazprom's export monopoly, um, was index for him to be moved out of the oil sector. What has struck me in the past year or 18 months is that a lot of the Russian, bigger Russian oil companies that used to leave the trading to others have actually opened their own trading operations. Um, have done so in Geneva and other places. So there's evidently a squeeze within um, oil trading um, with, with some of these bigger state players now asserting themselves and also some of the oligarchs that were linked to, uh, to Medvedev during his presidency also having more of a, more of a sway. So uh, that's what I can say. Why have we seen more bare knuckle fights in the gas realm than in the, the oil realm to date? Huh. Um, a few things. One, um, price. Uh, the oil price is basically the same no matter where you are. Oil is traded all over the world. Um, so uh, Lithuania, for instance, when it, it was no, shut off from access to, to Russian crude, it could, in theory, have got crude uh, Vybutingi from pretty much anywhere in the world. Primorsk was the most obvious place to get it, but it could have got it from anywhere else. If you're looking at gas in Europe, um, if Lithuania was cut off, to use the same example, then it doesn't have an LNG export facility, it doesn't have pipeline connections to Europe, and so there's simply no other option. So there's, there's a price aspect to it, which is that the price is globally traded, you can't really monkey around with it in the same way that you monkey around with gas prices, where there's a huge um, the huge difference in the price levels you see within uh, Russia and then and then former Soviet Union and Europe, um, and this is partly a, also a problem of of the mentality of some of the former Soviet states that they regard gas as something that should be given cheaply and in abundant quantities to them. It's part of their right. It's something that's happened for a long time. 
Um, and a lot of businesses, particularly in Ukraine, are, are based off um, cheap gas and are not actually vulnerable and are not actually viable as currently constituted without it. So there's a price element to it, and simply it's, it's easier to manipulate the gas price. There's more scope for um, for disputes over price. Then there's the infrastructure question that I mentioned. It's much less easy to substitute gas for some of Russia's uh, uh, eastern, na uh, western neighbours than was the case. Um, and then there's simply the role of gas in, in the economies, that because it's, it's a source for district heating, for, its, uh, for, for home, and for a range of industrial uses, it just has bigger ripple effects. Uh, ben Barry. Ben Barry from the ISS. In the lay down of the oil infrastructure, are there security risks, vulnerabilities, and potential flashpoints that you can discern? Um, in 2000, there was one. Oh, sorry. Uh, the question was, um, um, are, there, are there sort of security risks or potential flashpoints within the oil infrastructure? Um, a serious environmental accident in the Gulf of Finland could actually be quite serious because of the amount of, of crude that, that goes through there and heads Danish straight on. Um, there was also uh, a very real security risk for uh, Azerbaijani crude going to Russia in, um, in 2000 because the pipeline went through Chechnya. Um, but Transnef actually built uh, by a, a bypass Baku Tikoretsk in order to, to solve that one. Um, because most of the construction, uh, nearly all the construction has been solely on Russian um, territory, I mean, the, one of the rationales behind that was simply to minimize the security threats. Um, and now I suppose there's much less because Russia is more diversified. The problem was probably bigger a few years ago because there was no spare capacity. Now there is spare capacity. Yes, please. Um, to some extent, we've already covered on the infrastructure side, but what is probably missing at the moment is still what is going to happen in terms of production and what is going to happen to the Western uh, production and where the EU or Europe is standing in, in, the, in the whole future. Could you give us a bit of a view on this? Not easily. The question was. Um, with regard to the China-Russia deal, what will happen with regard to production and where might things go? Um, I'm struggling to answer that. Um, it doesn't look as though uh, Rosneft has enough capacity over the next five years uh, in its fields in eastern Siberia in order to fulfill all those ESPO volumes and supply this it's really astonishing like 24 million tons a year plan for a petrochemicals facility in the Russian Far East, which is obviously great if you're trying to develop the Russian Far East and stem depopulation there, but, but is, is a huge ask. Um, so I suspect that we will see some volumes diverted if those plans go ahead, although my suspicion is the plans are probably going to be toned down. Um, we still don't know exactly uh, what the volume of um, of deliveries to China will be because it's obviously a China deal that's that's been done, um, and they bargain quite hard um, over it. Uh, about a year ago, um, Russia and China were um, squabbling over the transit fee that was attached to the deliveries of uh, of Russian oil to China. Um, the Chinese felt it was unfair that they were charged the same rate or a slightly higher rate as oil that got all the way to Cosmino. The Russians didn't like anyone else telling them. Um, what their transit fee should be. Um, so when the Chinese then asked for additional volumes over and above the contractual limit under the 2009 deal, the Russians flatly refused and sent all the extra volumes to Cosmina. So um, I think whatever is in the contract to China, Russia will deliver. Whether it will deliver a barrel more, I'm not sure. So the question was, um, 
although Russia has sought to encourage the dependence of former Soviet states on itself, is it not itself deeply dependent on oil with all the vulnerabilities that come with that? Um, I suppose it's kind of a, a false um, a false conflict there because they're two separate things. Obviously, it's better for Russia in order to exert leverage over these states to have some some you know, residual dependence on them, on it. Um, on the oil point, well, you have to play the hand you're dealt. Um, uh, the Putin plan for the Russian economy seems to me is actually a, a fairly, well, certainly compared to Medvedev's modernization agenda, it seems to be uh, rather more realistic. It's about moving up the value-added chains. It's going to be more refineries. Um, we've also seen actually with, with car manufacturing, they've done a reasonable job of setting up a fairly big sector that now actually has a lot of components as well, so it's not just screwdriver plants. Um, there is a plan to move beyond that. There is there's a recognition that now infrastructure needs to be built and the economy needs to diversify, but there's an inherent tension, which is that the, uh, the oil and gas sector is the golden goose that provides a lot of the taxes. Um, and the tax figures are somewhat misleading also, because although they speak about, say, 50% of federal tax revenue, actually, when you look at the feed-through mechanisms, um, uh, it's probably a lot more than that. And if the oil and gas sector got into serious trouble, then the economy is in a lot of trouble. I mean, it's amazing to think that in 2009, um, when the oil price went through the floor and Saudi Arabia had 0% GDP growth, Russia had a 9% GDP contraction. Um, so the plans are there to diversify the economy, but I think they're quite difficult to put into play. And there's always the question of, it's easy to see where you'd like to be in 10 years, but how you actually get there when you need the oil and gas revenue in order to keep paying the pensions and the rest of it is a very tricky one. Gentleman in the corner here. Sorry, could you say what you mean by value destructive? Well, I suppose, I mean, would Russia, would the Russian economy prosper more if there was less state interference in the uh, upstream and in the transportation sectors? Mm. And do you think that if that does damage the economy sufficiently, that could bring about Putin's own downfall because of this uh, you know, strong association, right. with energy right. within Russia? Right. I, I'm not a fortune teller, so I'll leave off that last bit, but. Um, on the question, let's firstly um, pay some credit to Transneft that as a state-owned operator actually for many years um, delivered very low transit fees compared to, uh, compared to say, U.S. Uh, private suppliers and did actually build a lot of infrastructure. So I'm not sure we can say that Transneft's grip was necessarily bad for the sector. On the state control element, yes, inevitably, um, it does curb output growth, um, but... Um, if you look at the deals that have happened over the last couple of years, and uh, there's a few people in this room representing companies that have been involved in those deals, um, then you see the state consolidation control over oil is actually a necessary precondition then for really opening up um, for another wave of foreign investment. So with Rosneft now in top, on top of the oil sector in many ways, we've had very big um, uh, exploration uh, deals uh, signed with, um, with ExxonMobil, with Statoil, with ENI, uh, there's a couple of Japanese companies that have joined recently. BP has also entered Rosneft as, uh, as, an, inv as an investor and, and is hoping to get some, some JVs as well. So um, it's not necessarily the worst thing that could happen actually for a strengthening of state, state control if this then brings the technology and the capital and the project management skills that Russia needs in order to move beyond West Siberia, before it needs basically to move beyond its Soviet inheritance into the bright new tomorrow. In your talk, you had about five or six um, themes or, or trends about pieces that Russia is looking to put into place, partly for commercial, partly for political reasons, but in some amounting to a political economic um, um, strategy. But along the way, you also described efforts by some countries to lessen their dependence. There's a kind of a countermeasures uh, mm. effort going on here. And I just wondered if you wanted to say something about how effective you think those countermeasures are uh, in respect of Russia's periphery? Do they really amount to, uh, to much? Um, is, is Russia, by trying to clamp down so hard and create these dependencies, actually incentivizing countries to do precisely that which the Russians hope that, uh, that they won't? Okay. 
suppose let's take Azerbaijan. Um, countermeasures were very successful. Now, um, the stranglehold on, on uh, a Russian stranglehold on, on uh, Azerbaijani exports has basically been lifted. There's not even a Black Sea problem as such because most of the exports go into the Mediterranean, so they'd be loaded directly on super tankers. Um, and, and gas too. I suppose this speaks to the sort of broader relationship. It's interesting to me that um, a, a few months ago, um, Transneft actually revoked uh, Azerbaijan's long-standing uh, right to access to the Transneft pipeline system because the Azeris had for years and years been underutilizing those. Um, we put that together with the closure of the Gabala radar, st radar base uh, in Azerbaijan at the back end of last year. Um, the fact that the Azeris uh, now are close to, um, uh, to having an, an agreement on gas exports uh, into Europe, the you know, pipelines are nearly there in place, and we see that they have actually been quite successful in reducing their energy reliance on Russia. But nevertheless, um, you know, the bigger picture remains. Azerbaijan has to tread rather carefully around Russia. Um, there are direct security um, threats that emanate from North Caucasus for Azerbaijan as a, a nascent, simmering ethnic issue that could be played out. So um, the fact that the Azeris uh, don't really rely on Russian energy infrastructure very much doesn't mean that they cannot, uh, they can readily ignore uh, Russian positions or, or tweak the tail. Yes, Okay, so the question was, how successful has Russia been in deploying the oil weapon? Has it actually backfired as, as perhaps it did on, on gas? It's a really good question. I struggle to come up with a quick answer to. Um, I think in the case, if you look at what happened to Latvia and Lithuania, Russia didn't get its way. Um, but boy, it taught a pretty sharp lesson to uh, the Baltic states about the need to share or else, or else lose out. Um, I think Belarus is probably a more interesting one, where what you see is not a one-off, but a repeated game. Um, Belarusians have been very good at playing that. Whenever the Russians close one loophole, they seem to manage to find another. They open it up, they play it for all it's worth, and then they look for the next thing. And also there's a shifting, obviously, between sort of oil, between gas, between then uh, Russian budgetary credits. Uh, access to Russian markets, big orders from Russian state companies for Belarusian tractors, agricultural machinery, and some of the other heavy stuff that there's still a market for in Russia, but not many other parts of the world. So it probably has to be seen, I think, in a, in a bigger picture. Um, I think generally my suspicion would be that carrots work better than sticks. Um, it's when you're providing the right incentives that, uh, that Russia has more success with its policies. Is there a debate inside Russia on that question? Um, is it just taken as orthodoxy that the current plan <laughs> is, uh, is the correct one to pursue, or are there people who think that foreign policy needs to have rather different dimensions and characteristics? Um, I haven't seen a lot of, well, within the Russian liberal press uh, tends to be a lot of uh, criticism of the fact that the government is actually throwing away so much money on places like Belarus who are fairly ungrateful and just pocket every concession and look for the next one. Um, but, I mean, within the elite, I think there's, there doesn't seem to be too much rancor over the basic terms of, of oil policy because Transneft is fairly close to the government. It's a coordinator and therefore, you know, this is how things are. In any case, it's not really a society that in terms of the high politics levels and particularly questions that are so closely related to state power and state revenue, they're not really the things in which much discussion and free debate is actually invited. <laughs> 
So the question was, uh, does Russia have a plan for shale and what is the eventual emergence of shale and then Arctic East Siberia going to do for the, for the cost, cost base? On the cost base question, um, I'm not sure. Evidently, it is going to be more expensive. On the plans, um, I think this is, it's a question of tax. Um, and tax is actually a very difficult one. Throughout the 1990s, part of the problem for the Russian authorities, along with the fact that the oil price was so low was the fact that the oil companies were nearly always smarter than the finance ministry and whatever system they came up with the oil companies were very good at gaming it. What they alighted on eventually was a system that's actually quite effective in drawing rather high rates of tax but it's very context specific. It works well because it's in western Siberia where the infrastructure is, where the costs are low, where everything's, the ge geology is known and that works just fine. But the problem is Taking that system uh, and applying it then to eastern Siberia does not work terribly well. So some of the Rosneft fields have actually been tax-free. Now, there's a limit to how much production you can allow to be tax-free while simultaneously maintaining budgetary receipts at the right level. Um, on the Bajenov deposit, which is actually below the existing um, um, West Siberian fields, for instance, the worry on the finance ministry side is that... Um, these regular oil uh, oil wells will be re-drilled, reclassified as shale, and then the more um, the more uh, uh, favourable tax regime will will apply to them, and therefore uh, budget receipts will collapse. The last draft, the most recent draft of the new um, system for um, for uh, the tax regime on these new places has actually been sent back from the Duma because uh, the authorities, and particularly the finance ministry was so worried uh, about the prospect of being ripped off and gamed that it wanted to put um, meters basically on every stretch of pipeline imaginable and it put the costs, the projected costs through the roof. So tax is a big problem. Uh, you have to have the right tax regime to incentivize production, but for the authorities, particularly now that um, social obligations are considerably more higher than they were and they're on a huge rearmament program, yeah, budget receipts are actually very important, and the price that Russia needs to balance the budget now is well over $100 a barrel. Any final questions? If not, we started a bit late, so we will definitely finish um, on time. Uh, I'm sure Nick will be happy to, to linger a bit at the end for any uh, questions you want to put to him uh, uh, informally. And in any case, um, uh, he's going to be over the next few months or so, I think writing on some of these questions for ISS publications that you can expect to uh, receive through the mail in the, in the usual way. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and for the questions you posed, and especially thank Nick for an incredible presentation. Thank you, Nick.